reason we're doing this tonight, this study in the geography of heaven and hell, is because uh, had we not canceled for that terrible ice storm that came <laughs> over the, the weekend, yeah, 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 look, it was, it was my call. Um, so um, had we not done it, uh, we would have been, and we will be this weekend in Ephesians 4, again, uh, verses, why don't you turn there, chapter 4 of Ephesians. We're only going to be there for a moment, but it's important, because we're not going to go into it on Sunday, but there's, a, there's this little important three verses that Paul speaks of, and I'm not going to teach on that this weekend, but it's important, and it really brings up, it protracts out into an enormous um, topic. If you're there... Let me read it to you. Paul has finished, uh, where am I? Am I in Ephesians? There we go. Ephesians chapter 4. Two weeks ago, we looked at the first six verses um, where Paul talks about that we're to walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called, you know, with all loneliness, gentleness, lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, you know, one hope, your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, is above all, through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, therefore he says... This is a quote out of Psalm 68. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. There's an interesting phrase to circle in your Bible. Captivity, he led captive, Jesus led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, but Paul, you know, he raises the editors consider an, an, a parenthetical statement. Now this ascended, What does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended, speaking of Christ obviously, is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And then he goes on to talk about particular gifts, gifts of offices in the church, and we'll look at that on on Sunday. It's an interesting few verses there. Ascended, descended, went to the lower parts of the earth. What does he mean? And I'm going to tell you up front, uh, like some other passages in the Bible, often fraught with um, debate. Um, some would say, well, this speaks particularly of the incarnation, that he descended, you know, Christ came from heaven, and he came to earth, right? He, he, he embodied as a man. He lived among us. That, clearly, that's true. But when we start to put the verses together, I, I believe, something else begins to unfold here, and I think it's important that we take a look at it. So we're going to look at this matter tonight. We're going to be a few different places. It's not all in your notes, but we'll especially spend a lot of our time in Luke 16 as we look at uh, Jesus telling the story, not a parable, uh, of the rich man and Lazarus. Not, Not the brother of Martha and Mary Lazarus, but a beggar named Lazarus. In March 2014, you probably remember Malaysian... Malaysia Air Flight 370 disappeared after takeoff, was lost from radar, and 238 souls, 237 souls disappeared. Uh, TWA Flight 800, always close to my heart because I took that flight in 1993. In 1996, it took off out of JFK, and it was about 20 minutes out over Long Island Sound, poof, exploded. I mean, I always think about that. You know, you're, you're, in, the, you're in the jet, You've taken off, pilot comes on, you know, and says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we're up over Long Island Sound, we're going to be making a seven-hour trip to Paris tonight. Uh, Pretty soon the uh, flight attendants will come around with drinks, and all of a sudden, what does it sound like? What did it look like? Flash of light, and you're gone. Nine eleven, twenty nine hundred seventy seven people died. Haiti. I remember that one well, because I was down in the Caribbean area. Um, January 2010, 200 or 316,000 people died in between the volcano and, and the earthquake there. Japan 2011, you remember the earthquake? Um, 28,000 people died. Where'd they go? Where are they? I'm not asking you to answer it. What I'm saying is we have ideas of where people are. And it's amazing how very biblical people may think things that are not quite so biblical 
when we try to answer a question like that. Often because of our sentimentality or our, the way our own particular philosophy has affected or jaded uh, true biblical theology. We don't think much about where a person went from any of those disasters or the thousands of others that you know, have gone through our brains at times, unless we know someone who was involved. Um, there's a great website, worldometer.info. Uh, you can find out all kinds of things that are going on in the world right now, but, um, but Worldometer in terms of population, at least as of the time I wrote this, around 5 o'clock, uh, the world population, you probably want to know, was 7,919,870,900. It's probably, anyhow, you, it's higher now. Um, deaths per day, roughly 155,000 deaths per day around the world. That's about 6,500, give or take, every minute. That's 1.8 every second. Think about that. I, my, my clicker's not as good as it used to be. <laughs> That's what rheumatoid arthritis will do to your fingers. I just can't do it as well anymore. But think about that. 1.8 people every single time. Where are they? And I, I, I'm not going to say to you, you don't care. But in truth, we don't think about it. So in a sense, we don't care. It's just not really, it's not on our radar. But when we talk about this matter, it's true, heaven and hell. So where are these people? Um, there are different views of heaven and hell. I'm going to talk about hell at first. Um, there was a good book, I'm not saying you want to go out and buy it, but I remember having to read it in seminary. It was a great book. Actually, the, there's a series of books that are put out, written in layman's language, um, uh, four views of, three views of, two views of, and basically, like a four views of hell, uh, different theologians, the, the, maybe the one who um, is most prominent on a certain view of things, takes the leading role and in this case, four views of hell. Uh, the other three theologians, so the first one states his position, the other three argue against it. Then, musical chairs, the next one takes that chair, gives his position, the others interact with that. And um, so they, you know, the, the four views uh, were represented by you know, the, the biblical, the literal view, that's the one that we take here at Calvary, I hope you do too, uh, the view called annihilation, the... Um, the metaphorical or the symbolic view and the, uh, the Roman Catholic view of purgatory, which is sort of half a view. But, um, and I remember actually reading it, and uh, I was very impressed when we got to the Roman Catholic position on purgatory, that the, the, Ro the, the Roman Catholic theologian had, really, he had the class to say, I'm honored to be here in this discussion, but I have to admit that I don't deserve to be here because our view is not biblical. Like, well, that's refreshing, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's yeah. based in tradition. Um, but uh, so, you know, the literal biblical view, we'll look at that tonight, that, that, that hell is a place of eternal torment, flames, and outer darkness. That's hard for people to, to understand. And by the way, that's part of the reason why people argue with it, because it doesn't make sense to our, to our idea of dimensionality that there could actually be flames and uh, darkness at the same time. But that's just kind of naive. Weeping, gnashing of teeth, etc. Annihilation, uh, typically, if you're familiar with any of this stuff, uh, that, that's a position that you would normally associate more with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Mormons, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, and some, some other biblical scholars who are good scholars in many ways. It's just that's how they interpret this. I'm not here to, to, to explain it all. I'm just here to kind of give you that. Uh, the symbolic view, of especially... Uh, made famous by uh, Christian science. Uh, not, I say Christian scientists, but they're not scientists. Um, uh, it, but it, the, uh, I, I'll probably be unfair when I say this. And so someone who knows someone in Christian science is going to come up and you say, you got it all wrong. But basically the idea is, you know, pain doesn't really exist unless you're thinking about it. If you're thinking about it, you're feeling the pain. If you're, you know, if you don't think about it, you don't experience the pain. Like, well, I mean, okay, that's some, that kind of works in some areas of life. If you ignore it, you can push through certain things. But i got a feeling that doesn't really work with health. Um, and then, of course, uh, the Catholic position, purgatory, the idea that, you know, key, the key root in that word, purge, 
that there's a place where one goes after they've lived this earthly life uh, to be purged of their sins or their sinful nature before they go uh, to heaven um, and before they're either prayed or paid out. Uh, I didn't mean that as a joke, but you know, that's kind of how it works. So I just want us to look at the, the literal side of this tonight. Uh, it's not going to be all hell, um, but uh, I do want us to you know, look a little bit at heaven as well. But I think it's important because, particularly because of this passage. Um, incidentally, I came across this uh, just about a year ago in 2018. There was a Gallup poll. 65 or 68% of Americans believe in hell. Only 3% think they're going there. Uh, they actually think that 20, 35%, 25% of them think their friends are going there. So, I, you know, but um, all right, let's try to uh, kind of walk our way through. We're not going to spend all night on this. I just want us to, to, to look at this. If you would open your Bible to uh, Luke chapter 16. Now, the context here, and context is king in Bible study. Uh, uh, there's, there's an old saying that a verse taken out of context to be used as a proof text is nothing but pretext, okay? And so um, context is critical. So Jesus, the, the context of this section in Luke, Jesus is talking about the, um, the unrighteous use of riches, but we pick up in, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 19. And let me just read through it, and then we'll examine it a little bit. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple. Let me start over. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried. And being in torment he, in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then the rich man cried, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented or in, in this agony or you know, in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented." And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from here, here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. And then he said, I beg you, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the Bible, right? Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now, that's reasonable. I mean, you've got to think there's a, there's a real logic that, right? Um, but Abraham said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be, they be persuaded, though one rises from the dead. It's a, it's a tough one, I think. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a pretty tough passage if you really stop to, to think about it. This is a rich man. We read that he was clothed in purple uh, and fine linen. He fared sumptuously. This is a man who was really rich. Uh, how many of you have been to Israel? Either with us or, okay. Um, uh, some of you might, if you went with us, you probably went to the Herodian Quarter, uh, especially in recent trips. The Herodian Quarter, more recently uncovered, uncovered in the last 15 or so years. And there uh, you see what it was like for the upper class. It was the upper part of the city. That's where, you know, the upper part of the city is always where the rich people lived. And uh, there was upper side of the mountain so they could, they could look at the temple area and all that. It was just, you know, gorgeous. And uh, so what's been uncovered is amazing to see how these people lived. You know, they didn't have wall-to-wall uh, -wall carpeting like we had. They had wall-to-wall -wall, um uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, mosaics. You know, just amazing creations. Uh, indoor plumbing. 
if you think you don't think you don't associate that with 2,000 years ago, but indoor plumbing and just amazing stuff. I'm not going to go on and on about that, but it's pretty amazing to see. And this guy would have lived there, you know, uh, fared sumptuously, clothed in purple. You probably know that, but purple. The idea there were these little snails. Always kind of fascinates me. These snails that had this purple dye in them. Remember, Lydia was a seller of purple, so she was loaded. Because, you know, in order to get the dye, the, 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 you know, this purple dye out of these snails, you had to squeeze them. Imagine having a job as a snail squeezer. What do you do for a living? I, sneeze, I, I squeeze snails, you know? And uh, you walk around permanently stained, probably, you know? But, um, and, and so it was very expensive to have clothing. It was, it's always, pretty much in any culture, Purple is always associated with royalty or certainly with wealth. Um, and also it says fine linen. It does, it's not obvious on the surface, but uh, it means this is his underwear. I mean, he's, he's, Jesus is describing his boxers. Um, he just had, he, he had fine linen. He felt good all under. I mean, he just, he, he, no, I'm serious. Come on, think about it. You know, sometimes you get people in a Bible study, it's like, oh, you can't think about things like that. Well, Jesus is talking about it, you know, so you can think about it. Um, I mean, think of how he was clothed. By contrast, there was a beggar named Lazarus. Again, not the brother of Martha and Mary. This is a beggar right? Um, he's clothed with sores. As opposed to clothed with purple and fine linen, he's clothed with sores. You know, he's laid, he's crippled, right? He's laid uh, at the gate um, every day. And the man with the purple robes and the Calvin Kleins and all that couldn't care less about him. Um, this man was starving, Lazarus. By the way, uh, some of you know this, but I just want to kind of get out of the way. Many people Good scholars even will call this a parable, but there's no evidence this is a parable. Um, generally speaking, not all the time, but generally speaking, when Jesus tells a parable, he says, now let me tell you a parable about the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of heaven is like. But he doesn't name names. He's naming a name, and it's only my opinion. I could be wrong, sure. But I suspect in light of who he's addressing here, he's addressing the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, you know, he's addressing some pretty wealthy dudes, some pretty powerful guys. They probably knew this rich man. They probably couldn't have cared less who the beggar was and wouldn't have known his name, but Jesus is not naming the rich man, but he's giving the name of, of the beggar. And he's giving them an insight into what happened. Remember, the context is the ungodly use of riches, or wise versus unwise use of riches. And, and and, and he's saying, you guys don't do it the right way. And here's an example, I would say, of someone you know, one of your peers and what happened to him. And so there's this rich man and there's this, uh, this beggar, Lazarus. He, what, all he, he, he was starving and all he desired was to get a scrap that fell from this man's table. You know, in our day, we, we eat something, we take a, a napkin, a cloth paper napkin, we wipe our face, we throw it away. They didn't have those in those days, regardless of what some things you'll read online. That's not true. Um, uh, they would use a piece of bread, like a, like a think of a pita bread. Almost a, a lot of the bread that they use, flatbreads, almost like a, um, a glorified tortilla, right? Israeli tortilla. So a piece of flatbread, they would take it, they would use it as a napkin. They would wipe their mouth, and then they would throw it over their shoulder, and the dogs would eat it. Uh, this guy might have had his dogs, you know. He probably didn't, I don't think he had mangy mutts. He probably had, you know, a little poodle or whatever the guy had, you know, <laughs> cockapoo or something like that. Um, and uh, he, would just, he would just throw it over his shoulders. But this man longed, the, the, um, the beggar longed to eat anything that fell from the table. Instead, uh, the dogs came and licked his sores. That's probably the only comfort he got, is that the dogs would come and eat the ooze that came from his sores. Don't tell me that. I just had dinner. I don't care. Jesus said it. I have to explain it to you. So the dogs would come. They would lick his sores. I, look, I tell you this because cats would never do this. No. Cats would never do this for you. Only a dog will do this. And dogs are man's best friend. You never hear that about cats. I'm just saying. Okay. All right. So... Um, but you know I'm right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so let's come on. Hey, let's go, it's a heavy subject, so we've got to lighten it up a little bit. So, um, but the time came, you know, it comes for all. The time came. We read that the beggar died, carried 
by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died, and he was buried, and being in torment, he, li- he lifted up his eyes. Okay. Um, some of you, I don't know, because I've used this example before, so you, some of you may know, there was a man, uh, I follow this stuff because it's fascinating to me, uh, back in 2006, uh, one of the most famous rabbis in Jerusalem, uh, 2006, Yitzhak Hadori. Yitzhak Hadori was born in uh, 1898, he was 108 years old. Now think about that one, 108 years old. Um, Highly revered. I forget how many disciples he had. Something like you know, 150 disciples. Um, The man died, and and uh, in fact, at his funeral, the reason I'm bringing it up is uh, twofold. But one is because it was a big funeral. I mean, I'm sure when this beggar died, someone just found a dead body and they threw it into the uh, the, uh, into the valley, and he was burned. You know, just get rid of the body. Of course, when the rich man died, I'm sure he had a great burial. If you've been to Israel, you probably or Jerusalem especially, you have a sense of the Mount of Olives and the um, uh, the cemetery up there. Maybe he was buried there. The, if you don't get into the, the into the cemetery in the Mount of Olives unless you got some money, you know. And um, so, so Yitzhak Kaduri died. Three hundred and eighteen thousand people at his funeral. I mean, we've had big funerals where it's standing room only, but that's a lot of people. I remember a few years ago, and it always happens with the sudden death situations. Um, we had one that, I mean, just the funeral home alone, they had probably over 1,200 people that came to the viewing before we had the service the next day here. And they had over at Reed and Steinbach, and that la- line went out of Reed and Steinbach all the way down into Doylestown, around the block, and people were just standing in line waiting to go to see the family. And, to, um, and then here we were just packed to the gills. 318,000 people come out for Yitzhak Kaduri's uh, funeral. This man had written something, he put it into an envelope, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, do not open it until I've been buried a year. It's bad form, as it goes in Israel, it's bad form to speak ill of the dead um, within those first 12 months after a person has died. So... This guy knew what he was doing. He knows the loopholes. And um, so he said that to his disciples. A year goes by, they opened up the envelope. And you can read it online, if you can read Hebrew. Uh, It said that uh, the Mashiach of Israel is Yehoshua. Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Um, And he knew knew to to make sure they opened it after uh, he'd been buried for a year. Um, They didn't, it didn't go over real well with them. So here we get this interesting situation. The, the, the rich man ends up in this place of torment. We read that the angels came and gave a royal escort to this beggar into a place called Abraham's bosom. Let's just get something straight before we go any further. The rich man is not in a place of torment because he was a rich man. There was a rich man. Jesus didn't say all the rich men went there. And there was a beggar. He's not, he's not in Abraham's bosom because he was a poor man. Right? That's not the idea. The idea, it has to do with their heart's condition. And, you know, this is, this is pre the gospel of Jesus Christ, but still, you know, a righteous Jew was looking forward to Messiah to come, okay? So that, it's a condition of their heart. But for our purposes, we're looking at the geography of heaven and hell here, and we read that there are two places. They're in a place, now your Bible may say hell, um, but if it does, it's not hell as we would think of Gehenna or the lake of fire, okay? It's a place called Hades. In the Old Testament, the word that's uh, very often is uh, translated into English as the grave uh, is a place called Sheol, if you were going to put it in English like S-H-E-O-L, Sheol. Um, And it's the abode of the dead. And Hades is the Greek word, and for our purposes tonight, it's basically identical with Sheol. It's the abode of the dead. Now, but what we're learning here is there appear to be two, uh, we'll call them compartments, in Hades. So uh, let's, let's look again what's happening here. We read that um, the beggar was carried by the angels, verse 22, uh, into Abraham's bosom. So there's a place called Abraham's bosom. And the rich man is brought to this other place, both in Hades, um, uh, into a place of torment. The 
place called Abraham's bosom. It's not a place of torment. By ob- it's obvious as you read it through because he, he begs Father Abraham to help him out in this situation. Um, and so he lifted up his eyes. No, right? He lifted up his eyes. Now people can go very deep into this and say, well, he looked up. I don't know if, he, if it's just sometimes you just lift up your eyes and you can see someone on the horizon. So yeah, I'd be careful with some of those things, how you interpret it. But he lifted his, up his eyes. He looked a far way off. So we, what we know, if nothing else, is that it's quite a distance from where he was to where this beggar Lazarus was. Where are their bodies? You don't know. I mean, but we know that they were left on, on terra firma, right? Uh, they, they were buried. Uh, they, we, we know the rich man was buried. Uh, we're not told about Lazarus, but like I say, he was probably thrown on the, on the funeral pyre. Um, so their bodies are there. So we'll say, for our purposes right now, their souls are there. But do you see the verbs? He saw he saw Father Abraham. He saw Lazarus afar off. Uh, there was conversation that was going on. He could hear. He was experiencing you know, pain, torment, agony, in flames, right? He, all these things he's, he's experiencing. He can think. So, and, and again, for our purpose, I, I don't want to go too far into the weeds on these things, but the soul or the operating system. And I know that sometimes we, get, we can get mixed up between, you know, body's obvious, but soul and spirit can get us confused sometimes. Uh, for our purposes tonight, I would say, you know, body we understand. Soul is, my terminology would be, the operating system of the body. We have, we have a mushy organ called the brain, and that's really the operating organ of the body. It tells everything else what to do. It's, it's what actually registers the pain. You know, the pain may be experienced out here, but it's, a, but it's registered up here in the, in the gray mushy matter. Um, and, the, and it's the operating system, like your computer in a sense. You know, you have hardware, but it can't do anything without an operating system. So the soul is what tells, in this case, the brain operates at the dispense of the soul. And um, and then the brain tells you know, all the other parts of the body what to do, when to do it, all those things. It's the seat of the memory. Now, we know that the, the brain is, but the soul has those things. Where is sight experienced? In the, in the eyeball? No, it's in the brain, right? Because you know, it, the refraction happens. You know, we see something. It comes in. The, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the wavelengths of light go upside down. It comes in, you know, the, the image of you, it's all upside down on, on my retina, you know, but my rods and cones are picking up, you know, the, the black, white, the brights, the darks, the reds, and the whole Roy G. Bim, all the spectrum, all that stuff. And, and my brain is turning, at least I think, turning the image right side up, or you're all hanging from the ceiling. I don't know how that's working, <laughs> right? But the image is being sent, probably in a digital code, um, to my brain. Where's hearing experienced? Goes through the auditory nerve into the brain. You know, it's taste, touch, all those things happen up here. Even though we experience them without here, here, there, okay? So, um, so while his body may not be there, isn't that interesting? He remembers, he has a family, he's reasoning. So all those things are happening. It's amazing how many ideas we have, even as Christians, of what, um, of what experience is after death. Those things that mark a person's life, especially for the wicked, last forever. So, okay, let's try to move on here. Um, uh, and look at the, the reasoning. He, he, you know, his reasoning is right. I have a family. He loves his family. He wants his family not to end up where he is because he knows that this is, this is a bad deal. You don't want to be here. And he wants his five brothers to know that. And Father Abraham is saying it's too late. There's nothing that can be done about it. So there's nothing to change that. And of course, you know, even if someone goes back from the dead, um, they're not going to... They're not going to change their mind. And it is interesting, though this isn't the same Lazarus, it's not long after this that the Lazarus we know, brother of uh, Martha and Mary, good friend of Jesus, when Jesus calls him from the dead, then the Pharisees wanted to kill him, right? Because he was alive from the dead. They wanted to kill him because he was bad for 
their idea of kingdom. All right. And we can go through a lot of verses here, um, and we'll look at some of them in a bit, but um, a couple things I just want to mention before we go too far. Um, you know, Jesus, when you, when you look at the Gospels, 13% of everything that Jesus talked about um, had something to do with hell, judgment, the wrath of God, 13%. Um, and while the Bible doesn't give us an actual, you know, a real clear, vivid description, this is one of the great descriptions. This is, this is only of Hades. Uh, but certainly it depicts Hades and, and later on, of course, Gehenna, the lake of fire. We'll get to that. Um, well, I hope you don't get to that, but I'm just saying tonight we'll get to that. And it may feel like that for you right now, but I hope that it, it'll improve. You know, fire, darkness, punishment, to be excluded from God's presence, restlessness, second death, weeping, gnashing of teeth. And, you know, we all know it, but let's just underscore it. Regardless of what you think you know, you're, no one's friends are going to be there, and if they are, you won't be able to find them. I'm sure this guy had friends there, but he wasn't concerned about them. I suspect it's a place where at that point you're only concerned about what you're experiencing and how you feel right now. And maybe part of the, the torment of hell itself is knowing that you didn't act on the opportunity. All that you had. All that you could have done. Yeah, and I... Um, I'm as guilty as the next, I think. In one regard, I think we're all guilty of this. We can be just a little too flippant when it comes to what is hell and what happens for those who go there. Because it is horrifying, horrifying, horrifying. And there is no return. There is no escape. It's really, really forever. Just as heaven is forever and glorious. Hell is forever and it's horrifying and God forgive us for having been so flippant with this. And even say to people, what was it? I remember, oh, I'm an old politics guy. Um, but it was, uh, not Grover Cleveland, one of those guys, but uh, he had been vice president. Uh, maybe it was Grover Cleveland. And, uh, one of, you know, vice president sits as president pro tem of the Senate. And uh, two senators were arguing, and the one senator said to the other, you can go straight to hell. And Grover Cleveland said, I, I looked it up in the book, and you don't have to go. You know, that's the fact. You don't have to go. And it's amazing how you and I allow people to go. We all know that they make their own decision, but you know, what are our reasons for not getting in the way of them going? When you boil it right down, it's fear. I'm just afraid to say to somebody, if you don't accept Christ as your Savior, if you don't repent before you die, you're going to hell. You are going there. And no, Jesus doesn't send them there. People choose to go. Before we go further, let's take a look at uh, a couple things. Because... What we read here, now back in Ephesians chapter 4, is that Jesus led captivity captive. What is he talking about there? What does he mean by that? That he who first you know, descended also ascended. You know, he, he, he ascended up to heaven. Um, we read an interesting uh, verse in um, John chapter 20. You're familiar with it. Um, Mary Magdalene is there at the tomb. Jesus appears to her. You know, she thinks he's the gardener. If you just tell me where you put him, you know, I'll go get him. I mean, she's got chutzpah. You gotta, you gotta hand it to Mary Magdalene. And he says, Mariam. And she says, Rabboni, my teacher. She falls at his feet. What does he say? He says, basically, people think, and people get this confused, like, ooh, don't touch me. Like, he's gonna get, you know, Mary cooties. That's not what, that's not what he's saying. Don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my father. 
And people have different opinions about this, but you know, there's, there's an interesting idea. Um, if you turn over to Matthew chapter uh, 27, I always say this is, the, this is one of those verses that no one ever teaches on, but I've taught on it, so I guess I can't say that anymore. But um, we tend to slip right over it. He says this in Matthew chapter 27, um, beginning in verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. Remember that John tells us that it was there. He said, it is finished. It's paid in full, right? And then he also said, you know, Father, into your hands, uh, I, you know, I give you my spirit. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. The earth quaked, and the rocks were split. Here we go. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, who had died, were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and they appeared to many. I mean, uh, come on, how many times have you read that and you said, hmm, and just moved on? I mean, I mean, you know, think about this. You're at the produce section in Giant, you know, and you're you know, you know, looking at the, the onions or the cucumbers and you look over and it's like, Dave, I haven't seen you in years. Like, you're looking good, man. <laughs> There's a glow about you. <laughs> like, I mean, come on. They, they, they would have freaked people out. It's, a, it's one of these things that almost becomes a throwaway verse. What's happening? So when was Jesus crucified? What, what, what Jewish feast was, was Jesus crucified? Passover. Passover. And, and he was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when, on which Jewish feast was he raised from the dead? I, that's, a, that's a more difficult one for most of you, maybe. Okay, the Feast of First Fruits. And on the Feast of First Fruits, every obedient Jewish man would take a sample of his harvest. And he was, it was a wave offering. He would wave it before the Lord. Um, do you think Jesus kept the law? Not a trick question. Okay, I was going to say, or I resign. Okay, yes, he did. He did. So... Do you think he celebrated the feasts when he, when he was, yeah, he was always going up to Jerusalem during the feast, right? So if he's raised on the Feast of first fruits, do you think he offered a sample of the harvest to the Father? I do. And I suspect, that's all it is, that what we're reading here is a sample of the harvest. And maybe that's connected. I think it is. But maybe that's connected to what he says to Mary Magdalene. Don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to my Father. He's going to bring that, uh, that sample. It's just a, it's a suggestion, but I, I think it works. Um, so, yeah, it is cool. But think about that. So there's a sample of the harvest. You know, we think of people rising from the dead. We think of these in Matthew 27. We think of Lazarus. We can get very technical and say, well, this is not, like Lazarus is not actually a resurrect, re resurrection, you know, maybe you want to call it a resuscitation or something because he actually really would have died later on. I mean, I understand that. But there are, there are two resurrections. There are not 15 resurrections in the scripture. There are two resurrections. There's the first resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits of those who slept, the Bible says, right? So he's the first of the first resurrection. The rest of us who are in Christ are the rest of the first resurrection. Um, in fact, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but in fact, if you would, go over to Revelation chapter 20. Because we read this in Revelation chapter 20, and a lot of times we don't associate it. But we read, um, yeah, where do you start? Um, in the interest of time, where do we start? Okay, so, uh, hallelujah, and the 24 elders, the four living creatures. Oh, that's chapter 19. Okay, um, from the top, John. Okay, so uh, verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, chapter Chapter 20, verse 1, having the key to the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and he shut him up, and he set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released, Satan must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, like during the tribulation, those of, souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness 
to Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark. That's not the shot, okay, um, on their foreheads or on their hands. And you, you guys, come on, pick it up. Okay, so, um, and they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the, be- the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Oh, that is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. I'm emphasizing that because there are many people who can read a thousand years five times in six verses and still say, well, how do you know it's really a thousand years? Believe me, (laughs) I went to seminary with them. Okay, so... um, That's a story for another time. Maybe it's an allegory, but it's not. That's why we take the literal, biblical understanding of what's being written here. The first resurrection, Christ is the first fruits of those who slept. The rest of us, those who are raised from the dead at the rapture, or here, raised, in this case, those who were beheaded, you know, or hadn't taken the mark, they hadn't worshipped these, they they, they had been put to death during the tribulation, here they're raised. So all of us, then, who are in Christ, will be raised. That's the first resurrection. And they're not given over to the second death. What's the second death? Glad you asked. And we read this, that after the thousand years have expired, Satan is going to be released. You can read the rest. Let's go down here to verse 11. Then, this is after a thousand years, then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. The books were opened. You understand that? This is for those who have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades, that's why we're doing this now, because we're going to go back to Hades here. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to their works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the, lake of, into the lake of fire. So that's the second death. What's the second death? The second death for those who were not found written in the book of life, who had not given their lives to Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who will endure the second death. Now, hell is not a place of annihilation. It's a place of conscious torment. It's not metaphorical, it's not symbolic, it's real. All the senses are alive. In fact, did you read carefully? All of these dead were raised and given bodies at the second death. See, you and I are going to be given bodies that are eternal. We always talk about it. Can't wait to get my new body. Hallelujah, we say. We got all our jokes and all that. Yeah, but for the second death, they also get everlasting bodies which will never be destroyed because hell is forever. And just while we're there for a minute, people say sometimes, you know, isn't this a little intolerant of God? I mean, like, after all, like, why does he have to do this? Why, why, why do the people, you know, who, who don't accept him, why do they end up going to hell? Well, tell me, do you want to live with the rapists? Do you want people stealing your rims off your car, you know, while you're sleeping at night? Do you want, do you want people busting in and into your homes? Oh, you know, all these people and, and their characters, what they're like before, you think that's going to change? The character doesn't change once eternity comes. No. The Lord has given them the opportunity. Everyone has, given, has been given the opportunity. All right, so let's, let's do it. I just wanted you to make sure you saw this one particular verse there. It says in verse 14 that death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. Okay, so the lake of fire um, outlasts. It lives, it goes on, not lives, it goes on forever. And death and Hades, this place called Hades, was cast into the lake of fire. So when we read in Ephesians chapter 4, in the verses we started off at, that 
Christ led captivity captive. What do we see there? We see that there are two places. We saw it in Luke 16. There are, if you will, because vocabulary starts to fail us, okay? But we'll say there's two compartments, two places in this abode of the dead called Hades, or in the Old Testament, Sheol. Two compartments. On the one side, we see uh, Jesus refers to it as Abraham's bosom. It's a place of paradise. It's a beautiful place. It's a it's a comforting place, all those things. And then there's another compartment. It's a place of torment. And, and those who are there are conscious of that torment. We see from the, the rich man there. He wants to just get a drop of water on his tongue to quench his thirst for a moment because of how terrible it is there. Eh? And, um, and yet we read that Jesus led captivity captive. In fact, if you would, for a moment, some of you are thinking, he goes all over the place. Well, I know. But um, over in 1 Peter chapter 3, one of those strange passages we read sometimes, but if I didn't say it, someone's going to bring it up, so let's address it. 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter says this. That's 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. We know that. That's, that's Bible basics, gospel basics so that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. By whom also, this is is the big one, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Okay, what he preached in prison. Where? Well, I'll say Hades. So wait a minute. So he went down there, and a lot of people believe this, so I wanted to disabuse you of this idea tonight. Okay, a lot of people believe he went and he preached the gospel to those who were in Hades. No, he did not. Okay, preach is how it gets uh, translated, the, the English word preached. There are two different words that you could translate as preach. One is evangelizo. You can pick that one up, evangelize, right? We think gospel, preach the gospel, right? That's not that word. This word is caruso, means to declare something. Okay, so he didn't preach like, here's your last chance, you know, get on board now. That's not what he said. He declared, and by the way, to whom? It says, to the spirits, the pneuma who were in prison who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long suffering of God. So he's referring to those who were disobedient. And some would even say, we've got to be a little careful here, uh, that they're angelic spirits, could be, but I don't tend to go there. But the point is, he, he's not offering them a chance out. He's declaring that it's finished, that it's done. And at that point, we read something, right? We read, and, that's, and I'd say that's where you connect, Ephesians 4, verses 7 through 10, that he led captivity captive. Oh, oh, um, oh, hold on. Um, so in Isaiah, I love this. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Um, you've heard this before so many times. I know you have. Um, you've heard this. And it's, you, know, you can go there if you want. So, but this is, this is where Isaiah prophesies, and, G, and Jesus says it in Luke chapter 4. Remember when he's in the, when he's in the, uh, uh, the synagogue in Nazareth? Remember they hand him the scroll of Isaiah? He reads from it, which happens to be this passage. And then he said, I tell you the truth today. This word is fulfilled in your hearing. He read this. I'm reading it from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings, or gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty to the captives. Remember he led captivity captive? Um, The opening of the prison to those who are bound. Do you see the connections here? With have got to be a little careful how much we, we draw straight lines through all these things. But you see what he's saying? 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he's, and he's anointed me to preach gospel, the good news, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He stopped there. He didn't go on with the rest of it, which says, in the day of vengeance of our God. Because that wasn't yet. The day of vengeance of our God is the day of the Lord. That's the wrath that's coming. Jesus didn't come to preach the wrath of God. He came to preach the goodness and the salvation of God. He stopped at what you and I would call a comma. I would say he's a dispensationalist, but I'm just kind of joking around with some of my theological friends. But um, he, he's saying the other is not yet. The, the day or rather the year, the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he came to, uh, to preach. And the reason I'm saying all that is that he came to set those prisoners free. Those who were bound, yes, it was a place of paradise. It was the place, incidentally, where the thief on the cross, you have these two thieves. The one is railing against Jesus, and, and the other thief, you know, we call them thieves, they're murderers, they're insurrectionists. And, and they... And the one says to the other, don't you even fear God? Don't you even fear God? Now you're nailed to a cross. And don't you yet fear God? And he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, wow. Talk about a quick conversion, huh? Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did he say? I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. Where? Paradise. When? Today. So when Jesus gave up the ghost... His body went into a tomb, right? Where did his soul and spirit go? Someone said heaven, but I would say he went to paradise. And where was paradise at that time? This is where the, you know, this, this is where controversy comes in between some people. It was in what we would call Abraham's bosom. But he declared, I don't, we're, we don't have recorded for us what he said, but he declared there, I would say, that they were his. And he took them out of there. Remember what Paul tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Was that the case prior to this? See, now it is though. See, that I'm not, when I die, I hope I'm raptured, but, but if I were to, to die today before the rapture, my, my soul and spirit, my body will be buried. My soul and spirit are not going down to Abraham's bosom. They're going to heaven. See, that's part of the new covenant. That's the abode of the righteous dead today Amen. is in heaven, right? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I might be making this as clear as mud for some of you people, and I hope I'm not. I hope that it's, um, it's making some sense to you. You know, we can we can beat up this topic of hell all you want in the last couple minutes. I, you know, I, I've, what, what's it like? What's it like? I mean, just to think about heaven a little bit. You know, um, in Revelation chapter 4, you know, John says, you know, after, after Jesus says, you know, take, take some letters and send them to these churches. And we finish chapter 3 of Revelation. And then John says, and then I heard a voice. I saw a door open in heaven. And I heard a voice saying to me, come up here. And immediately, I was in the Spirit. And he begins to describe headquarters. He begins to describe heaven. And, and, and in fact, whoa. Um, here you go. Here you go. Come on. We're going to sped red here. Um, there we go. There we go. Hallelujah. All right. Um, I looked, door open, standing open in heaven. First voice, which I heard was like a trumpet speak to me. Come up here. I'll show you the things which must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like jasper and a sardius stone. Uh, and so it was like, it was like a diamond and, and like this green and red all around him. Uh, and there was a, a bow or a rainbow, it's how it gets translated for us, around the throne in appearance like an emerald. It wasn't a bow, it was a 
a circle, okay? Um, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of the sevenfold spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. This is heaven. So don't, don't, get, don't get weird about it. Just absorb it. Just sort of... Uh, you know, let it soak in to you. Um, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal in the midst of the throne and around the throne, there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And the first living creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like a, had the face like a man, the fourth had the face like, was like a flying eagle and the four living creatures had six wings full of eyes around and within and they don't rest day and night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him and lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and, 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 and by your will they exist, and, and they were created. I mean, yeah, I want you to think about those things, because if that's your destiny, if that's where you're going, this is what you're going to see. It's a, just a taste of what you're going to see. It's amazing to me sometimes how, how people say, you know, and, and I know Christians who say this a lot, like, what? really? Like, what am I going to do? And oh my is one of the only expressions. Yeah, there are some others which you shouldn't preach. But um, like, are you nuts? Usually because people haven't thought about it because our we're so consumed with the things of planet Earth that the things of the next world, the, the real world, we, we don't think about. We don't think about what they're going to be like. And so all we think of is, well, okay, I'm going to sit on a cloud and I'm going to strum a harp. But like, that's a movie. Get rid of that. Okay, that's just get rid of that. That's not what it says. And we were talking about a kingdom that's going to, to be. I mean, and, and, and heaven itself is really just a temporary abode. We're only going to be there until Revelation 19 when Jesus comes on a white horse with King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh. And he comes and he slays all of his enemies, the Battle of Armageddon, right? It's not, we always say it's the Battle of Armageddon. He just speaks and they're dead. That's it. Right? And then there's a cleanup campaign of some sort. You know, we looked at that in Daniel chapter 12. And then a 1,000 year kingdom on planet Earth. And then that's gone. And we go into a new heaven and a new earth which are eternal. And we have no need for fluorescent lighting. And we have no need for, for you know, the sun or any of those things because he himself is the light. I mean, you know, you think about this. It's amazing sometimes how people will think and say, well, you know, yeah, 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 I hear you talk about heaven, but come on, really? I mean, I, I appreciate earth. Um, yeah, imagine so you had, imagine you got two twin babies in the womb, you know, and one says, you know, I hear that outside of this womb, there's something entirely different. I mean, there's oceans and there's, and there's wind and there's clouds and there's birds and there's, and there's sunshine and there, there are huge mountains and, and there are waves in the ocean and you can smell it all and, and, and it's just glorious. And the other one says, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, no, this is what I know. I'm comfortable here. Well, that's how many Christians are even, let alone the non-Christians. You know, I read, a, I read about... Um, it was Admiral Byrd, I think. Um, what was it? Yeah. It, Richard Byrd, Commander Richard Byrd. He spent six months at a hut, in a hut on the South Pole. Four months were the Antarctic um, winter. No sunlight. No sunlight. No sunlight. And we think, well, it's science, you know. If you're going to go there, be prepared. Yeah, well, that's cavalier of us, you know. But... Um, let me read you what he said. Um, really, sun didn't shine for four of the six months he was there. In his journal, he said this. He said, I crave light as a thirsting man craves water. There's a funereal gloom that hangs in the twilight sky. That's all you get is a little bit of twilight in the dead of winter. Three weeks before the sun was supposed to shine again, he wrote this. He said, I tried to imagine what it would be like, but the concept was too vast for me to grasp. 
He'd only been away for six months. The, the concept of sunlight, he's saying, was too vast for me to grasp. And the day the sun made its appearance was overwhelming to him. He just wept. He just wept. That's, that's the sun, 93 million miles away. God created that. What's it going to be like when we see him? Well, I mean, really, it's just fascinating. That's the place we're going to live. See, so we have this abode of the dead, the righteous and the wicked dead. And the righteous dead, after Christ gave up his life, paid the price for all the sins of the world. The resurrection, he took captivity captive. He brought it to heaven, to his father. So that all of the righteous dead prior to the cross are now with him. As will we and all those we love who know the Lord are also now there with him, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He led captivity captive. Now, though that compartment... Abraham's bosom, is emptied. The other side is filling up at 155,000 a day. 1.8 every second. And heaven, people are still going there. And until the day he comes for us with the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and, and he calls us, he calls the righteous dead out of their tombs, out of their graves, and we, Paul says, who still remain, will be caught up together with them, with those who, the righteous dead in their graves, will caught up, be caught up together with them in the clouds, in the, in the Shekinah, and so we will ever be with the Lord. By the way, that happens before the tribulation. So by the way, at Revelation 19, when he comes on a white horse, he says, we come with him. Dressed in linen, the white robes are the righteousness of the saints. It's his righteousness that we've been clothed with. We come also on horses, which I think is going to be kind of a funny scene in some sense. But because um, some of us aren't that good on horses, but I'm sure we'll probably be, we'll adapt. Um, we're going to come with him. We will have to have been raptured in order to be there in the first place. An hour is not long enough to talk about some of these things, but I just think you know it's so important for us to bear all of this in mind. And yet, people continue um, to resist him. I'm sad for the theologies that have made it sound like um, God has appointed the wicked to hell because he's not. We read in Second John, chapter, 1 John chapter 2 that he, Christ, is the propitiation of for our sins, and not for ours only, the church, not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world, that if any would place their faith in him, that they would be saved. And God is not desiring, Peter says, Second Peter chapter 3, he's not desiring that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's his heart's desire. And he hasn't left it to pastors, he's left it to the church to bring the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, so that as many as possible are going to be saved on the day of redemption. What a day that's going to be. Let's stand together.